Welcome back to the OC show, guys. This is Chiro, and tonight we're going to have a lot of guests. Because guess what? We're going to have, of course, our nice Billzoy from the UK. Hello. We're going to have Tool from India. As usual. Hey, guys. And tonight we're going to also have two special guests. That they're not actually guests because they're actually the hosts for the original OC show. We're talking about, of course, Shala and Truthman that are tonight here with us to discuss about a nice trip that they had at the Intel OC lab. But without further ado, let's dive right into the quick competitions that took place this week and the news in the HW rankings. Tool, what can you tell us about it? Um, well, I'm going to be really quick this time, but uh, there's, there's basically there's a whole bunch of competitions starting. Um, the, the, the main highlight, I think, this month will be the OC World Cup uh, World Championship in, in Yogyakarta that, um, you know, HW Bot and Jagat Review and everybody are doing. So that's starting on the 5th. That's going to be really, really interesting. Um, and then we've got, obviously, we've got the OC World Cup Montreal qualifier as well coming. So, yeah, really, really nice things to look forward to in terms of actual, actual overclocking events this, I mean, uh, this month. And moving, I mean, talking about competitions, um, the Road to Pro um, Round 3, we still have more or less the same order. We've got Gunslinger, JPM Boy, and Strat Z in the lead. Uh, not much is not not much has changed there. In fact, from last week when we covered that in in detail, um, Division One Round Three is also pretty much the same. Iki is still in the lead as <laughs> as he was last week. So yeah, there there hasn't been much change in these competitions because there's like there's still about 28 days left in them. There's still a month to go. So it's uh, we have some time before things actually start to heat up, and it's pretty much the same story with Division Two Round Three as well. And all the others. The main, the main actual highlight this month. I mean, uh, uh, right now is um, we've had um, the HW Bot uh, Team Cup 2017 that's also going. So um, there again, you've got Overclock.net, you've got Warp Nine Systems, and ROG Check OC guys. Uh, the uh, Bill's Rides old team is still in fifth position, which I mean they're they're, they're holding and they're holding by quite some margin actually. Uh, the the Reddit Overclock team and uh, Hardware Canucks is up there as well. Good, good to see Hardware Canucks uh, still up there. And um, yeah, the actual the actual rookie rumble just finished. I mean, it's actually finishing in 14 hours. So I don't think we're gonna see very much action. I mean, we might still still see some change, but I think it's gonna it's gonna pretty much finish in the order it is right now. Uh, you know, you've got rookie rumble 47. You've got um, Garfield in the lead, Protein in second position, and Castle in uh, third position. Big shout out to uh, Binoy, who's in ninth from India. I mean, he's in, he's. I've I've I mean, I've been meaning to get in touch with him. So if you're watching the show or if you do see this, get get in touch with me, bro. Um, Rookie Rumble AMD 41 is also 14 hours to go. You've got Suffrage in the lead. Believe uh, and um, Pinch Joyce from India is in third position. Only 14 hours to go. So that's basically pretty much it in terms of oh yeah, and we've got Alza as well. So um, Alza is we've got we've got two days left. Raf is in the lead. George Storm is in second, and Super Tonaldo is in third place. Santa Lau is in fourth, and um, G Trude is in fifth. Yeah. Um, so Alza, two more days to go. I think that's going to be the competition that's going to heat up the most, along with uh, the ones in Yogyakarta, the OC World uh, the World Championship. So, yeah, I think not much else happening in terms of competitions, uh, but lots happening in terms of actual live live events and stuff like that this month. So, good to see. And, uh, yeah. All that's right. Awesome. That's, that was much quicker than the last episode when I wasn't <laughs> present, but I had the, 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 the pleasure to watch the entire episode and I was astonished by the amount of competitions discussed by this nice guy <laughs> so guys um let's talk about what happened this week uh hardware wise let's see what happened uh, we had quite a couple of launches some silent some went quite popular some went like meh it was quite a mixed bag of feelings first of all we're gonna start with the silent guy the 7920x the 12 core 24 thread cpu just uh, released in the market. There was no PR, no press release to publish or stuff like that. We just had the CPU pop-off in the details all around the world. 
So I guess it's it's quite curious that it happened, but it's not, not something really. Um, how could I say? It's not something we didn't expect from Intel. I mean, they focused their attention on the 10 cores, on the 16 cores, and the 18 cores, not much on the 12 and 14 core CPUs uh, because of the AMD competition. And speaking of AMD, there was also the 1900X launch this week, literally yesterday. So yeah. we had the 8 core 16 thread CPU on Threadripper platform being launched on the market. <clears throat> uh, this, this CPU is pretty similar specs wise to the 1800X, but the core configuration is totally different because in the 1800X, we have the single couple of CCX uh, connected in the same die, you know, the usual Ryzen 7 CPU. In this CPU, the, 19, the 1900X instead, we got two CCX separated, like one CCX per die in the usual diagonal configuration that we came to know with Threadripper. So it should be the closest to the best performing in games configuration because of the lower latency for each CCX, if if I'm not mistaken, because the other option was two plus two on each CCX and that would have brought so much latency that games would really be affected negatively also not just games also memory uh, related uh, productivity benchmarks and software that rely on the latencies between cores for example video editing and video creation and 3d uh, rendering stuff uh, we we have a nice thing about the 1900x tool am i right we got yeah. a full-fledged eight core cpu with a lot of pci Lanes. We got a lot of PCIe lanes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if somebody's looking at, you know, like, um, I mean, just a just like a cheap workstation, but like a GPU heavy workstation for like video work and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, you do have the horsepower now. Literally, I mean, it, it, this was one of my pet peeves with uh, Intel taking away our PCI Express lanes for cheaper CPUs, like this generation. So it's so uh, yeah. I mean, it's good to see AMD come in and actually fill that gap because. Whether 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 Intel you know believes it or not, um, the the entry level mainstream uh, workstation market is is literally bread and butter for a lot of system integrators and a lot of even work, uh, you know professionals actually who can't afford thousand dollar fifteen hundred dollar CPU. So yeah, it's just good to see somebody come in and actually fill that gap. So kudos AMD. Yeah, that was that was good. And yeah, that was one of the main points we discussed. Yeah. while the, C the Intel CPUs launched. Like, also, yeah. yeah. Also, the good thing is we don't have to pay for RAID. I mean, uh, well, there is no RAID 5, but yeah, with, uh, you know, with the announcement that AMD came out with uh, this week, that they let us do uh, RAID 1, RAID 0, and RAID 10 with up to 10 NVMe devices with the, with, with, with the new BIOSes that's coming in, I think, second or third week of September. Uh, September 25th, 25th. So, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. The, yeah. the fourth week of September. Fourth week of September. Yeah. So that's gonna be that's gonna be very interesting. Ten NVMe devices in RAID zero, that would be. Yeah, I mean, you probably need something like one of these. I mean, you probably need the. I don't think I actually. I, I read I, something uh, about it. It's not I, supported I, I, yet. Yeah, this one isn't. But you'd probably. I mean, how how else are you gonna get ten devices on on the yeah. board? That's definitely something that's that's gonna get announced. Because yeah. if they're supporting it, then yeah. I expect something to be, you know, some some more news about that coming pretty soon. Oh, and but also there was a nice line in the slide that AMD mm -hmm. published for the 1900X launch: no SSD brand restrictions. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, we got you. <laughs> and it was yeah. like because it was a it's a fight on every single aspect, and they were like, it's free. You can do more devices, no restrictions. So yeah, yeah they, they they nailed it. I mean, yeah, it was it was weird that they didn't have it at launch. Maybe they were just working on it, and I they made so it. Too. Yeah, I think so too. That's that. that was... That's really nice. And this 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 many launches that we saw during these last six months uh, managed still, to push. Like, oh, 
firestorm of like product launches i mean in terms of like new hardware like I've, it's been the busiest few months i can remember in quite a few years in terms of like right. hardware well probably there's been populated uh periods but not with serious competition between the yeah. two big yeah. brands yeah and like uh, for example even them doing the launch on the on 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 the quiet for the 7920 by intel that was a little strange actually because you don't really see intel launch high end cpus without any kind of you know media or any kind of like serious cover i mean any kind of like advertisement or coverage or any of that like this one was just it just appeared out of the blue at new again hey there's a new cpu i mean like yeah, yeah. that was quite weird i mean <laughs> That quite shows how the wind changed for both yeah. the companies. We yeah. have on it, one it's, side it's AMD. Good. It is yeah, really good yeah. to see that uh, AMD is actually back in the uh, back in the game now. Yeah, true. It true. is. True. It's just, I mean, at the end of the day, we win. It's 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 good for the consumer, and uh, yeah, it just pushes it just pushes both of them to deliver quality products to exactly. us. So. Totally. We I mean, these these kinds of activities will get more money for AMD so that the R&D department is going to perform even better the next year, yeah. the next two years, next five years. Meanwhile, Intel is going to finally take advantage of their market position because of all the money they do. Uh, indeed, we're going to see co coffee like really soon, like at the end of the year, maybe yeah. CES, if it's, I don't know, it could be CES launch. Could be. Could yeah, well. It could be a January launch. We don't we don't have any information yet. And probably if we do, we couldn't share them. But we suppose it's it's gonna be in January. And yeah, that that that's pretty much <laughs> about this situation. But speaking of AMD, I'm, I'm really AMD thinking he's trying to fish for us to let him know exactly what this could be, right? <laughs> I haven't said anything. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen anything. I don't know anything. Oh, I don't even know why I'm here today. <laughs> I only saw dead core CPUs, the the classic stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> usual things you find in smartphones. You know, ten core CPUs from Intel. Fifty <laughs> And speaking again of AMD, though, this week we had the bad news about some of the gigabyte boards, right? Yeah. Strange, strange reports of like the 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 new F5 BIOS dumping insane amounts of B core in there. Like uh, when it's on auto, like when you that's well, just, when you well, as far as I can tell, it's when people use offset voltage. Offset or uh, yeah, yeah. So like what yeah, the broken dynamic V core. Um, if you mess with it, you're gonna be well. It's gonna push as much as 1.55 volts. I mean, it's gigabyte. Well, it's actually strange. It's always and gigabyte. I was talking to a friend of mine who actually has the has the gigabyte board, and um, he was like, "Well, I with F5, it boots up at 1.55 volts, which is a lot. I mean, it's pushing that just like <laughs> at stock. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is that's that's that that's quite that's quite a bit. I mean, yeah, 1.55 is a lot." It's still very interesting to see that some of the motherboard manufacturers did have this kind of issue even after years and years of developing the biases. Because this, yeah. is, main, this is many. Like it's a, like it's not that about this developing, not... it's about testing stuff. Yeah, yeah like, like QA. This yeah, is like, never, when you, when like, you, something, you can't you just write code, assume that it works, push it, and then get this kind of article a few days after it gets launched. Like, <laughs> this is like nobody actually checked what they did. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure they're yes. not the only one to have this. I'm pretty sure, like, oh yeah, the, no, I, I'm 100% certain that, that, like, I'm 100% certain that the like BIOS, uh, that like uh, motherboard vendors, they push BIOS updates and then without actually checking if the the BIOS works properly, uh, extensively. I mean, ROG, right? Um, with Elmore, like Elmore's basically been beta testing BIOSes on the overclock.net forum, which True. Elmore from, from Asus, he's been beta testing uh, BIOSes for the Crosshair series of motherboards uh, through the overclock.net forum. Pretty yeah, like much. a crowdsourced uh, testing. Yeah, because yeah. apparently yeah. Asus can't pay for testing. <laughs> you know, yeah, they don't have a huge budget. To the guys who actually, actually have the motherboards, because... 
I mean, on one hand, I get that if you're testing like memory compatibility, it doesn't really make sense to try have you know every memory module on the market. That's just not going to work. Yeah. But voltages, really? Yeah. Come on. Base clock? Anyone? <laughs> uh, no, that, that I think their their BIOS designer just did not actually think about how somebody would use the base clock feature. <laughs> for for Azrock, that's just like somebody really didn't think how how the overclocking process works. Or okay, <laughs> for those that went on the previous episodes of the show, <laughs> there was quite a couple of episodes with Bill really? going rent about the it's X370. Like, I get really, like, in general, it's just BIOS is doing things on their own really annoys me. So, yeah. And, and Azrock yeah. has a tendency to do a lot of, like, we're going to help you not suck at overclocking uh, kinds of stuff. But it's always implemented in such a way that it just doesn't work when, like, it does weird stuff. Right? So... Okay. Yeah, and it's been like that. I mean, it, you, uh, I I noticed something like that even with uh, the Z170 uh, DOC formula. I mean, this is it's a uh, it's it's kind of known, but it does tend to overvolt the memory. Like when you set 1.91, when you're operating at like really high RAM voltages. When oh no, I remember like one of the first annoyances I had with Azrock is you set a memory to, uh, like a memory multiplier. Yeah, and it would automatically adjust your north bridge. Which is yeah. just like, why are you doing this for me? True, true. Uh, you're talking about previous generations, right? Yeah, previous okay, generations. Never, not, not current never had an AMD CPU before this year. So, no. yeah, I, um, I don't have much experience. Did you start somewhere? Yeah, I started with Ryzen and now I'm on Threadripper. So, start about from the bottom now we're here. <laughs> just like oh, yeah. Song. You just got a brand new 1950X a couple of yes. years ago. I I'm, I managed to spend too much on both CPU and mainboard, but now I'm in the elite league. No, just kidding. <laughs> I'm still a noob and I will always be a noob, also because this CPU is useless for extreme overclocking. But I digress. <laughs> um, yeah, um, this week was quite uh, quiet. There weren't many... Uh, epic news or stuff like that. So we'll throw the ball at the two special guests that we have tonight because they're going to tell us about their trip at the OC Lab in uh, Oregon, right? Portland. Yeah, they were at the, uh, they were at the Intel campus at the OC Lab. That's yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so we actually, uh, so Isai, Truffman, and myself, we went to um, to Portland, where because Intel has several uh, sort of locations. They have some more in the Silicon Valley. They have some in Portland. They have some others also on the east coast of the U.S., etc. All sort of doing different things. Uh, in Portland, it's uh, they have some fabs there that are building Kaby Lake CPUs. Um, so. Mostly like uh, recent chips and mostly desktop stuff. Um, I don't. I don't think, for example, high-end desktop chips were made on the at the fabs that we saw from uh, from the offices there. Um, so what we what we did there is that to basically uh, be able to uh, at the Intel OC labs. So they have this lab uh, in house, and uh, people could basically simply let us use. Uh, the gear that was there to do testing for ourselves. So we had uh, we had a 360 camera that they loaned to us, which was pretty cool. Um, and then uh, we tried to see how we could use that uh, for for streams. And uh, so we did a bunch of uh, different tests. I will get back to that later. Other things we did, we had uh, some meetings with them, uh, mostly uh, talking about you know uh, the state of overclocking in general, and uh, to uh, to show uh, to a few guys that were. Uh, um, were present what we what we are trying to do so for example uh, the C show for when it's uh, to uh, have a like some kind of a news thing for the community and have people get together to talk about what's going on uh, but also the events that are that are happening and um, yeah all that kind of stuff so they even uh, they organized a, like a small 
I'm not sure we could call it a conference, but basically uh, a small session where they invited everyone that wanted to, plus people could join on the call to uh, to have us uh, basically uh, show them what overclocking in the community uh, is all about. So what you have to wow. think is empl uh, Intel is thousands and thousands of employees. So even if we have one or two contact persons there uh, for overclocking, um, a lot of the people don't know and when it comes to basically uh, convince people to for example support for events or even just have a uh, intel look in certain directions when it comes to overclocking uh, as simple as uh, evolutions to xtu software or evolutions to future things you could do by overclocking things that we need uh, things we that we know are not working or simply yeah just have a discussion to see from where we start to where we can go, right? So we need to have the most people uh, on our side. And they need to understand what the community is also looking for when, they, when we're talking about overclocking, right? Because um, those people, many people at Intel, they are just like uh, regular people. You know, there's a lot of people that are doing uh, engineering works and electronics and specific things, and overclocking is not necessarily something uh, that come in their mind when they are designing the chips or pieces of the chips. Um, so it's good that they hear what we are doing with chips, so they can also have that in mind. Not necessarily mandatory, but they, they know it's happening, and they know this is what people are doing with chips. You know, so it might be good to to think about. So that's that's what we try to do. Um, so that's what we did in general. And then, for, for when it comes down to uh, the 360 testing, uh, maybe Zai, you want to talk about that? Oh yeah, sure. So we had the we had access to one of the 3D camera. Um, I think it's the Aura 4i. Uh, that's that's the name. So these guys had a had a 360 camera that comes with like this little box that is doing all the all the stitching. And we used that one for like a, like a good three days. And we're actually uh, experiencing on it, and we're trying to see how we can use that to actually improve the the different shows that we do for for people that at overclocking TV or watching overclocking TV, which is a, there's some good stuff that can be done. There's an interesting one. Uh, there's a lot of challenges as well, uh, especially for live streaming, because you guys know there's a lot of 360 cameras on the market uh, nowadays, but it's very difficult yeah. to still do a proper live stream of 360 for very like yeah. immersive content. And, and usually with 360, at least from what we see, the quality isn't that great right now, like in terms of just the picture quality. So that, just... that is actually one of the biggest issues, uh, yeah. why it's not that great. So you have to think about yeah. the, the way the 360 camera works. Uh, works. Is it 360 or 180? That's the exact same concept, just a number uh, of, of the people of you that will change for you. So when yeah, you have a 360 yeah. camera, it's basically like, like, for example, like four cameras uh, looking in each direction. So this way, okay. this way you can have um, a software that is the stitching software, and that will actually merge the side of each of the uh, each of the of the views that you have. And the reason why the quality is not that great is because when you actually take a video or post a video or take a picture, what is happening? It's it's not expanding your your frame so you still have like a like for example 1080 so uh, 1920 by 1080 pixels but you basically instead of having like like this like 45 or 70 degree angle view you have 360 so basically yeah. every every time you're gonna look at some specific part there's gonna be a subset of that of which that 1080. this is the yeah. this is the only reason why the 360, uh, the 360 videos are looking crap most of the time it's just because of that uh, that issue the seven main the seven biggest issue for that is that the lenses that they use they have to be a static um, a field of view um, yeah so, so you need to have a static angle and you need to have a static um, depth of view that you're gonna have and you cannot change that because if you change that it would be very weird like you would be actually watch, yeah, watching like from that lens it's actually yeah. on focus and Close then you up. turn and yeah. it's not on focus. So you cannot yeah. have that yeah. as well. So that yeah. people some limitation. You have to hear um, the distance to the camera. You want to have the subject, how you want to turn it around. It's actually something, it's easy to shoot in 360. Anyone can do it, except that if you want to do it correctly, in good quality and something reliable, 
becoming extremely complex. And we had the chance to we had the chance to experience something is that the camera we are using that uh, Intel provided to us um, can output 4K resolution, which means we can actually get a 4K feed in 360 mm -hmm. and input that to our other system with one of the new capture cards we are working on for for overclocking, which get 4K input as well. So that means now when you look at as part of like a sub portion of that think about 4K, you divide, you divide that by four, so that's like 1080 basically for each um, uh, each 90 degrees angle. It's, yeah. And if you look okay. at 70, that's gonna be a little bit more than 720p in quality. So you, mm -hmm. just think about that. You have to send a 4K stream out for people to watch in a quality that will be pretty much a little bit uh, higher than 720p. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so if you take all that in account, it's it's becoming completely insane the requirement that you need, and I'm I'm pretty sure we're gonna see um, a major move toward 8K and 16K in terms 16K. of uh, in terms of 360 precisely. cameras. Precisely. Precisely. And yeah, the, and then that that just like multiplies the whole processing requirement to stitch it in real time. Like that requirement will go through the roof because you're dealing with so many more pixels and just so much more yeah. information. Data, yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, just like the, the GoPro, because we did test something about the stitching as well. The, the lag on oh, the stitching, nice. you want to talk about it? Yeah, yeah so yeah. basically, all that stitching is software, right? So, yeah. what happens is that um, it takes time for the computer to, to, to render the, the, the output of that. So, you already have the delay of the camera being captured, getting into the computer and maybe stored in RAM or wherever it's stored temporarily. And then you have the, the math that kicks in and just yeah. aligns all the shit and tries to correct the color sometimes, even if you want to adjust, you know, white balance and for distortion and compensate for stuff. And then all this, and then back out to a HDMI connector for to go to a screen or 4K capture or whatever. So this takes about, for the camera we used, the Aura 4i was between three and five seconds. Okay, so wow. it's a huge, if you're thinking about uh, video production, it's a lifetime, basically. If you divide that by 60 frames per second each time, um, it's, a, it's really hard to get it synced up with, back with the audio of the place, which is, which has no like, because audio nowadays is really fast to deal with. Imagine you have a picture, picture cameras from the other angles that you can display within your 360 view. Those ones will be much faster too, so you will end up with something stupid like a, you see the screen in the picture and then three seconds later you have the 360 view that is actually synced back in time to what it's supposed to be. Right. So you have to delay all that, which every time you delay, um, you have to store all that in raw into a memory of the machine that does things. Um, and then play yeah. a reason get back and you have to yeah. pray that you have a consistent uh, sync, basically. Sync. True. So True. If you don't if you don't have a consistent sync then uh, like the delay and all that changing, then you're you're actually totally <laughs> you're totally screwed. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's one of the that's one of the issues uh, with the sync. And another of the major issues, really, it's actually the bandwidth to stream anything out. Look at this show. We are always constantly struggling with bandwidth most of the time, even though we have 20 megabytes up and down here. Uh, on events, it's really hard to get anything more than five megabits if you don't want to pay for six hundred US dollar for one day, you know. Yeah. Like, and, and then, and then imagine here for a four K stream out, YouTube recommends between thirteen megabits per second minimum, up to fifty megabits per seconds yeah. for regular use. Uh, we did our testing, and at the Intel OC lab, I do have to say they had 100 megabits upload, so we could test properly, which was great. And uh, but this is a no go for most of the events. You have to figure out basically uh, so many things before you go to a venue, before you can actually promise that any of those 360 stream can go out. Which yeah. is why nowadays, if you watch 360 content, it's either at bigger events like DreamHack, where they provide a huge amount of bandwidth, and usually for the major streams, uh, they either do, they do it discounted or there's so many sponsors to pay for it that it doesn't really matter, or you see it afterwards. So it's a recording, it's uploaded to YouTube, and then you can watch it post-produced. And here you can align the sync and the delays, and it's a lot easier to deal with everything, really. True, true. So yeah, 
Yeah, that's the magic the, of post production. That, 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 that <laughs> yeah, you have like the, the, the post production position of what you are. Yeah, exactly. Of course, it's more flexible, but you lose the the freshness of the content. So you gotta find the right compromise. And, and when something uh, anyways, guys, in- sorry for the audio quality, uh, but those two nice people are traveling around the world. That they still make it to the show, so you should be complaining. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's so... actually getting better. I think. Yeah, it is. I, I... It, it is getting better. Okay. That's nice. Uh, except for the green thing that is behind Tim. What 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 did you put there? What is that? I don't know. Oh, okay. I I, I couldn't see the, oh, that yeah. many pixels. <laughs> <laughs> see, that's that's an issue in three sixty. That's that would be exactly the same. Yeah, exactly. You not be able to read what, what's going on. And uh, we did some extra well, with uh, adding extra feed into the. And this was something quite interesting to do, but some very tricky as well. There's not that many stuff that they can do that for lives. You can still do that for uh, post-production and even for post-production, not, not that easy. And yeah. because you have to keep the uh, steps filled, well, you need to have the speed angle different. But nicely. But there was some uh, very, uh, very fun testing. So that was. Uh, one of the main things we're doing at OC Lab, and we also had the chance to um, show them what we're working on regarding overlay the size, which is the telemetry. Basically, you have a small device, and then you connect that to Raspberry Pi, or basically, like the Raspberry Pi is the device connected, and so put that directly to the back end in the cloud, and you can display that for you. That's something that um, Dr. Wiz is using. I've been doing that for quite some time now. Uh, all of the data for, for for a few months, and you can display your temperature, your voltages, uh, but it's not coming from Windows. It's not coming from the. Uh, it's something completely from the outside, so you can actually have your go into. You can see the. So yeah, yeah, it's actually a good addition for this for the stream, and uh, yeah, there was some uh, some discussion. As Timothy said here, um, basically we're presenting what uh, what we are doing, but as well as uh, how we see overclocking community evolving. It was our like kind of like our opinion on on. So it's uh, very interesting to have uh, to be able to share that. Uh, that's something that I will never hope that possible one day, uh, especially like 50 years ago when you start to look, then. Uh, Ten years ago, when planning to bring over, uh, that's not something we would have thought would be. Yeah, big up Intel. Thank you so much for welcoming us to the lab. Uh, it was fun. Sometimes with the. Yeah, that was nice. That was really nice. Actually, and... I want to add one thing before we we move on topic. Um, basically. There's something cool with the 360 that we did there. Uh, is that we we like a like a truth you talked about the telemetry is that we combined all that together. Uh, so we just wanted to test. Uh, so we have some videos. It doesn't look good, and actually we can't release them because it's in the lab and there's some stuff on the whiteboards behind me, for example. Um, okay. So, ba- <laughs> but basically, uh, what we did is that we tested that you can, for example, if you put a VR. Uh, headset or you look on your phone and turn around. Um, what is cool about uh, this is that you can imagine you have two overclockers in front or around you. It's like you're in front of the stage, basically. And you can look around, you can see the systems and you can see what they are doing. Um, and then overclockers always stand up and down. So if you're actually doing a stream, the camera is never, always never right. So here 360 solves that. You can always kind of see uh, the guy, what he's doing. And yeah. we uh, add into the sphere the screens that we capture from the computers, so you can see it uh, in a in a good fashion. It's like it's in focus. It's added on top of the of whatever is going on. Uh, and if you have a smartphone with a player that allows you to zoom, you can even like pinch to zoom onto the stream video 
and just get closer to the monitor. So you can choose where you're looking, and if you're looking to the guy, you're going to see his screen next to it, something like that. And then with the telemetry on top of that, you can, for example, uh, you could see uh, what is the current, uh, for example, the current boot code, what is the current uh, CPU frequency, what are the current voltages being used, uh, what is the base clock, the multipliers, uh, all that kind of stuff that we can read from the system. And you can display those uh, in that sphere as well. You can can present if you spend time to present it in a nice way it can be really, really cool um so we'll try um next week we'll be at the dream hack in montreal for the world tour yeah and uh technically we have a good internet and the guys from intel allowed us to borrow the 360 camera so it's in our luggage <laughs> so <laughs> if, <laughs> if you can next week we're gonna try to put all that together we're not in the lab anymore so we can actually stream it out and uh, hopefully we can show you some cool some cool and interesting stuff that should That's be awesome. nice. Yeah, yeah, it seems like Chris, Christmas came yeah. early for a couple of yeah. guys here. Yeah. <laughs> we're, yeah. we're gonna have to return the camera, so it's not like yeah, but it's, it's, it's gonna be fun. fun. But is it some good story to play with for for the next? Yes. Is, would it be possible to like sh like I mean I don't know if it's under the ND or something, but can you show the camera as well, or that they don't want people uh, the to? The camera we can show it. It's on the market. For after oh. I, uh, I think over I will just get the box. So, so the this camera <laughs> microphone in my ears. Uh, so basically, the camera what it what it looks like. You will see it if we bring it. It's a uh, it's like a piece of plastic. It's kind of like this crammed four GoPros inside. So the lenses look really, really pretty much the same as those classical, uh, you know, like a wide angle action camera lenses. So right. there's a uh, two on each side. Uh, and uh, then it has a small box down and it has a LAN cable. So I'm not sure what kind of signal goes through that, but oh. the four video feeds go through that and go into like a like a PC box. So if the PC in there, uh, it's all proprietary software. So I have no idea. There's actually no, no display out from that. The only HDMI out you get is the compiled and restitched feed. So you don't really know really this. Uh, what I'm you can sure. do with that sort of like a closed box. Um, but basically, it's really simple to use. You just get the camera, you put it on a tripod, and um, it just captures, goes in the computer, you get a 4K uh, HDMI feed out, and uh, we just input that in the 4K camera, and then we can do uh, 4K capture cards, and we can use that. So it's uh, it's wow. pretty, pretty cool, yeah. And it's wow. quite tiny. It's small like, small like that. Yeah. Yeah, that is that is pretty neat. So uh, so so that tiny little thing. I mean, the there is a RJ45 jack on the camera, and that's yep. it. So at the bottom, uh, truth you can show it. There's a there's a small connector at the bottom at the base. So I think that's where all the cables from the camera connect. I'm not sure what they do in there. It would be interesting to open it up if we could just to <laughs> see what comes out of there. And I know that. Uh, Basically, they also add uh, send power to the the cameras that cable too. So they for sure ah. two of the the tiny cables are used for power, and then probably the rest must be data. But no idea data, what kind yeah. of product they use. That's pretty slick. That yeah, is. I found the the link to the website and I shared it in the chat. So guys, if you want to take a look at the camera like specs and stuff, if you're into it, you can take a look at that on the website. It, it's quite expensive. It's yeah, it's, 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 yeah, yeah, it's expensive. So yeah, you're gonna have a lot of fun. You're gonna yeah, have a lot of fun. And you say, know, it's just, just estimates you have the camera with four high lens, and then mm -hmm. you have the box. That's nice. Nice. It's like a Zotac computer. Well, yeah, that does, does look like Zotac for space. I don't know. But oh yeah, actually that's that for the Z box. But it's actually even bigger than it. Yeah, uh, we can say that's so taxi. <laughs> mm -hmm. ah. And um, in the back, the actually, box. We, we do have like, like, a, like some HDMI, uh, some HDMI out, uh, one oh. up for the camera and then one for the network and some. Uh, yeah, uh, the, 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 the PC with it, it's the Z box from Zotac tool. Except this one has HDMI inputs. Mm hmm. I mean outputs. I mean, outputs. yeah, yeah. Only outputs. Yeah, oh, this only one has only outputs. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So yeah, then that's that's quite an interesting idea. Uh, speaking of the meeting with Intel, if I may ask, uh, is there any everything you want? We may not be able to answer. But ask everything. 
Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, is there any plan of making also another benchmark, like a 3D benchmark together with Intel? I mean, I know Intel doesn't do doesn't GPUs. Do GPUs yeah. yeah. So actually, actually but, they, uh, we had a conversation, uh, a long one about XTU, right? Because that's the Intel official benchmark. Um, so nice. the guys uh, from Intel, they're the one coding XTU. Uh, and it is integrated with the Shaibat. So what it means is that it's sending the scores and the data information from your system and the overclock and the, the dials you have changed to HDIBOT so you can have that in the database and compare load people's profiles and all that. Uh, so they were kind of asking, hey, what can we change with XTU? So we just gave a bunch of ideas, uh, things they can do. Um, you have to think it's a it's a big company and things like that or take some time for it's yeah. you know from the moment where you discuss it in an informal meeting to hey you know this is going to be the next feature um they did mention that they wanted to do more with xtu so fix the bugs of course is kind of the priority at the moment uh but um you know add maybe new features something that could be also uh more interesting for for people and to be able maybe to do more stuff. So they talked also, you know, sometimes in XTU, it doesn't work very well with all the motherboards. It really boils down to how well it's integrated. So that's something they're also working on because in the end, uh, the image of XTU is defined by how usable it is with all the boards. So if they are, right. if it's not working with half the boards, it kind of defeats the purpose of adding all those dials. So that's something they're also looking into how they can make this better. And um, yeah. Adding a benchmark, like a graphics benchmark, I don't think it was at the top of the priorities. It's uh, doing a 3D benchmark is a lot of work, and also Intel. I think it's still focused on 2D and memory benchmark. Maybe maybe memory would make sense because XT already integrates the stress test for memory, just not the memory yes. benchmark. So yeah. probably for for my opinion, that would be the the next move if they add something as an extra benchmark within XTU or a separate application or something because IGP. Um, you have it, yeah, on all the consumer chips, all the Core i series chips, but all HEDs, you don't have it. So that, that's yeah. yeah so for some some of their uh, of their views that will work for some of the others that don't exist. Uh, so I, I do actually follow up on Jimson. All that is our own opinion. Consider them specific. Thing is, in my opinion, I think the next move for them will probably be having them. Because that's, as you say, that's already built in. And for the CPU. Um, another question that is not actually Intel related. I'm sorry if I'm no, go on, go taking on. That's, too much time. That's what I, even the guys on the, on the chat here. Uh, not that I seen any, unfortunately, yet. At least I hope. Um, any plan for HWBot to make an AMD benchmark? Uh, that should be actually asking Peter. <laughs> I think I think we should yeah. ask AMD Lights for that. No? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Well, actually, it's not HW but making the benchmark. That's making compatible. Oh, so, okay. Actually, yeah. you know what? That's a good question, and I could ask that question, uh, Leslie, uh, on the panel that we have at the PAX in the next. Oh, okay. PM. Awesome. So we have someone that is uh, well placed with name data that's going to be one of the who moderates here at PAX at 2 p.m. Uh, from the CAD Theater. And I could ask her if they plan to have a bench within their not called overdrive anymore. It's the Radeon, Ryzen uh, uh, Red Ryzen UT. That could be the key point is to make it yeah. reliable enough to accept it as. Uh, as a situation, and then of course we can keep in the contact with HW, but maybe uh, include an auto validation. That would be great. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. Actually, that you would know what? Awesome. I, I, I'll be honest, and I will say if all the benchmark we use all add integration with HW, but with it, that would be great. not limited to yeah. Intel or AMD. Cool. And also, we wouldn't have cheaters. Now, that's, that's, not, that's, yeah. not, that's, not, that's not the problem. It's that. Uh, it's out so much uh, the different step you have to from benching to see the score you have to set but you have to open all the extra uh, things so yeah I do consider that the future lies within the integration 
the, the data and the integration again. So that's one of the reasons we do a lot of a lot of time for it live. That's the reason why if you can do it, even if it's directly me or team or any of the guys that we know that are in flight, but if there is integration with the official rankings, that's that's just great. I mean that's what I what that's that is exactly what is happening in the game industry. Your game is not integrated to the ranking system basically non-existent. Um, yeah. Smite uh, had issued the ranking system was so close to only them that they had some, had like a few hundred thousand players at some point, and then they just crashed down to just 10, 10 of thousand of, uh, of players because they never wanted to open their uh, ranking API or submit scores somewhere else or have coverage by some people than that. There was like a lot of uh, this happening in the game industry is a good opportunity for us to not reproduce kind of, um, I won't say error, but I say a trial that did not succeed as expected. Not really a failure because it actually does help a lot of people on the other side. It might be a failure for that project specifically, but it's not for everyone. I guess we have the chance that the game industry is very strong and have a lot of good ideas, and we should actually build up on that. Yeah, follow actually, the trail. Yeah. I'm also adding something because it's related to um, to what you said before with uh, HJBot making the benchmark. Uh, since I do some work for HJBot, uh, I think it's important to, to clarify for people who might not know. Uh, but um, so XCU is a benchmark from Intel. So the software is theirs, they build it, they design it. Uh, sure, they had inputs from the community and from HJBot on how to do it and maybe how, how it should uh, inter interface with HJBot, but HJBot only provides the, the database for the community to be able to exchange profiles and compare scores and all that. So HJBot itself, uh, the benchmark that HJBot does are HJBot Prime and uh, then- X265. Yeah, so, so some examples like that, and even X265, it's a guy from the community doing, it's not HJBot building the benchmark. It mm -hmm. is yeah. integrated with HJBot. So HJBot, if you want to build your own benchmark, you send a message to massman at hjbot.org. You ask, hey, what the, what is the documentation for the API to be able to submit scores from my benchmark to HJBot? And you will get the documentation and you can start coding your own stuff that completely interface with HJBot. And you can do a lot of things. You can send the scores. Uh, you can even pull out rankings and display them in your own benchmark. You could even uh, have display competitions with ranking leaderboards from that competition in your benchmark. You could do a ton of stuff. It's all API calls. Um, but it would not be HJBot making your benchmark. You would have to code it so it works with HJBot. So the same way, if you could make a benchmark for AMD yourself, you could ask AMD to make a benchmark for themselves. Um, it's up to anyone. It's also a different vision, right? Do you want the benchmark to be something proprietary that the person that makes it, it only works on one platform, or do you want it more open so it works on everything? So that's also part of the discussion, right? Uh, is, there, is there a point to make a, AMD on the benchmark, uh, or should you focus on making a benchmark that is used across all Intel, AMD, ARM, or whatever, whatnot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's something you got to decide if you want to build your own benchmark, uh, for sure. The more platforms you want to cover, the more difficult will be the job to measure things in a Related. fair way, because yeah. every, every platform computes things differently. And sometimes, sure, even for example, if you run the benchmark in Java, uh, Java being compiled or whatever could be compiled specifically for a version, even between the versions of Java, the performance is different. So it gets yeah. really hard to to methodically compare something, which is why 3D Mark only runs on Windows and they don't look at the other platforms because it's it's too much work and it would be probably not really worth it. And the benchmark they do for Android are only Android benchmarks. They are not the same benchmark so the identical same. Yeah, they don't mix in the rankings. Uh, your smartphone is a Core i7 or something, because yeah. it's not necessarily representative. So yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's that, that that's that's a nice point of view. I uh, never actually considered the fact that it's actually not HWBot directly doing the benchmarks, but just allowing the others to integrate everything into the database and letting everyone access to the data and the APIs and stuff.
So yeah. Uh, and and, yeah. and it's it's a it's a cool thing actually. It's better to do it this way. Ashaibot has plenty of work to do than building benchmark. Yeah. Trust me. So 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 basically, it's it's just easier. To, it's it's easier this way. Uh, I think we we can even see it from a from a like how much work it takes already to to fix some of the things in the benchmark. Uh, it's like yeah. No, no time for that uh, via Asia, but I think Asia, but is better of taking care of the API and uh, making sure the community grows in terms of uh, teaching overclockers to teach other overclockers and keep going this way. And those who know how to make benchmark should be the one doing benchmarks. And if I wanted to see something, probably we should probably look more into uh, gaming benchmarks, which could be reliable and be used for overclocking that would be great that would be even better because then we could uh, draw more people into uh, catching their attention hey you play this game it has a reliable benchmark if that benchmark indicates with hdibot it's even better and Ooh. then you have tournaments on that and people would probably discover overclocking this way right now all the gaming benchmark all suck i mean they they're just not reliable they're just they are some are completely biased towards certain types of graphics cards or drivers yeah. or other things. It's like yeah. you yeah. can scores that you, you want to say. Some even benchmarks have just uh, print out the score in the text file, like GTA Five. Uh, yeah. How can you trust anything like this? You know, it's like you can throw any score you want. In that kind of case, it's not really interesting. True. Yeah, that's true. true. Then that would be that would be great. Like, let's say I don't know. I don't know what's the your time. Oh. All right. First, everyone else. Uh, Jim, do you still have something? No? I think we do. I don't even think that's, that's live. Oh, we disconnect. All right, for the guys in the recording that you might see it on um, on YouTube, um, we are actually about to close the show anyway. Um, there's going to be a pull out. Uh, let me check that. Okay, so I will finish the I will finish the, the live here for you guys. Um, one last thing I want to announce for the uh, Aussie show for episode ten is that. We will be for the first time presenting a panel about PC performance at the PAX West here in Seattle. So that's the reason why uh, the net was a bit uh, today, because we are actually uh, in our accommodation here. Uh, we're going to the show in the next 10, 15 minutes. We're just going to head back to the show. Saturday, 2nd of September at 2 p.m. at the Cat Theater in the PAX West in Seattle, we will be hosting a panel called Faster Than Ever, the race for um, Basically, it's going to be explaining and discussing uh, a different point of view on why do we have P component always improving performances. Uh, the panelists that we will have, I will, I will be moderating that panel. Uh, Timothée will be there uh, as a director of operation of OVP. Uh, Ustan Bennett, is a builder and a broadcaster at the Jet System when they build a CAO and DAO big rigs for uh, creative people. And we have Leslie Pietano, which is from AMD as well, on the panel. So that's going to be three different view of the race for PC within the, within the market that we are on. Uh, we're going to have the overclocker point of view, we're going to have the builder and uh, people supporting that, and we're going to have the manufacturer. Uh, regarding that specific race to performance. Um, I guess I'm going to have to end the show for once. There's not going to be after party here. So anyway, if you if it's actually back online on uh, on um, sorry guys, there's not going to be any after party because we're going to go straight into the PAX West. If you guys like the show and you want to see more and discuss more about uh, what we had uh, discussed in that show or in the next few shows, let us know in the comments. If you want to have special um, about what we did at Intel, you can go on the YouTube page of Overclocking TV and there's uh, OC the vlog. This is the short uh, series of different um, series of different videos that we did where we were explaining uh, day after day what basically when we when we could do that, what exactly we were doing, and it's 
a little, a little bit more going in deep in depth regarding the few topics that we did discuss today. So guys, uh, I appreciate you watching this video on YouTube. Give it a, a thumbs up to uh, get better internet next time. Um, if you are not happy with the internet, just keep the thumbs down. But uh, that's not really our fault. We don't, we can't do much for that. And if you want to know something, just let us know. That's it. I'm Truthmind signing off, and next time.